Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're excited that so many of you could join us today for Reclaiming Connection and Community. I'm Jason MacArthur, the Events Coordinator for the Public Programs Department of the California Institute of Integral Studies, a nonprofit university in San Francisco. As many of us are descendants of settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent, we, CIS Public Programs, must recognize and never forget that our university's building in San Francisco occupies traditional unceded Ramatush Ohlone lands. If you're interested in learning more about native lands, languages, and territories, we encourage you to visit native-land.ca. Now, let me first introduce our presenters, Mia Birdsong and Rachel Bryant, and then we'll get right to the conversation. Rachel Bryant serves as a Chief Diversity Officer for the California Institute of Integral Studies, where she earned a master's degree in counseling psychology with an emphasis in community mental health. Her passion and research interests situate her life work and scholarship at the intersection of social justice, education, and psychology. She is working to facilitate closure between knowledge production in institutions and the need for knowledge in communities traditionally excluded. Rachel is also a core member of the Healing Clinic Collective, which provides loving traditional healing sessions to people from especially traumatized populations in the Bay Area. Mia Birdsong is an author, activist, and facilitator who steadily engages the leadership and wisdom of people experiencing injustice to chart new visions of American life. In her book, How We Show Up, Reclaiming Family, Friendship, and Community, Mia charts swaths of community life that promise of our collective vitality. She is creator and host of the podcast, More Than Enough, from the nation, which expands the current guaranteed income movement by tapping into the voices and visions of low-income people. And now, let me turn it over to Rachel and Mia. Well, hello, everyone. I don't know about you, but I have been waiting to show up to have this conversation with you, Mia Birdsong, about hey. how we show up. And I have to say that when I first received this book, it was like mana from heaven. Um, it felt like it was very timely, and yet you wrote this book before the pandemic, and it is so needed in this time. So could you start by telling us a little bit about why you wrote this book and who you wrote it for? So um, I did that thing that Toni Morrison said to us, which is would like, you know, write the book that you need. Um, and this was very much a book that was born out of questions I was asking myself about how to, in a, in a context, in a culture that emphasizes insularity, um, independence, um, that, that, that tells us that our value comes from productivity and that we are in competition with each other. I wanted to understand how to think about what it means to be in community, what it means to um, re-imagine friendship for myself, um, what it means to build family, all of those things. Um, I wanted to understand how to do that in ways that didn't um, reinforce or uh, replicate um, these systems of like independence and insularity and competition. Yeah, I think, like I said, this is a very timely conversation as many of us are in isolation. One of the maybe silver linings or gifts of these times, these very uncertain times, is that we are all questioning what is most important to us. And I don't know about you, but I'm coming up with it's my folks, it's my relationships yeah. that are mattering the most, right? Whether it's through a phone call or some sort of a drive-by connection or whatever that is, yeah. I think we've essentialized that, right? But why is it so hard for us to admit that we need one another? Why did it? Yeah, come? I know. Right? Because on the one hand, right, like our need, the fact that we need each other is because we're human, right? Human beings are social animals. Um, it is in our, in the way our brains are wired, it's in our DNA, it's in our biology. Like it is a real thing that we actually need each other. In fact, um, there are sociologists who think about relationship who would argue that the way that, you know, that Maslow's pyramid of needs 
um, which has, you know, food, shelter, water on the bottom, that actually connection should be on the bottom because as humans, we actually can't get any of those things without each other. When you're, when you're born, you can't do anything for yourself. You need people to care about you in order to make sure that you get fed and, you know, are taken care of. Um, even, you know, as adults, like, you know, I'm in a house. I did not build this house. <laughs> Somebody else built it. Um, we're not, you know, alligators. We don't get born and then just go about our business <laughs> and take care of ourselves. We really need each other. And our need for, you know, it's not just about kind of establishing um, or getting the things we need to like literally, you know, materially survive, but it also is that we actually need love. Like love's a thing that human beings need. Um, we need care, we need to belong. So everything, right, about what we are as humans tells us this, but culture is really powerful. And, um, you know, America, and this is true of lots of Western cultures, um, but I know America, so I talk about America. And America has um, a very old history that tells us that um, in order for us to be valuable, we have to be productive. It tells us that the um, model, right, the model we should all be aiming for when it comes to success is a very insular nuclear family. Um, it tells us that asking for or accepting help and support is weakness, right? That you only do those things if there's something wrong. So we have, if you, you know, grow up in this country or if you come here and you kind of adopt um, American culture, you are told that your need for other people is, um, is a kind of weakness. And I mean, it is astonishing to me on some level how powerful that culture is and how, um, how much we internalize all of that. But that's what I wanted to really kind of unpack for myself um, in the book. And I'm really glad that other people are finding it useful to unpack those things as well. Yeah, Mia, and what you're really unpacking is this American dream, this, this idea of an American dream that we've all been sold. And you do that so beautifully through all of these stories that you've collected. It's like you went back to the future. You reclaim this ancient technology of simple storytelling and connecting. Totally. People. Um, and it's so beautiful um, each and we'll maybe talk about some of the, um, the stories, but you know, there's this, this conversation happening in the academy right now and in the community too, maybe on some level about decolonizing. Mm -hmm. Decolonizing this and decolonizing that and I thought about your book and I'm like it's not only you're talking about decolonizing um, our lifestyles um, it's also showing how we decolonize research and I just wondered mm. after that projection if you actually identify with those terms like decolonizing I mean I think I do um, because I find them useful to kind of understand the practice of excavating right, the ways in which I've internalized white supremacy, capitalism, patriarchy. Um, and I think it's, it, it is useful to understand that, you know, colonization is an act of like um, putting something in a place that is not from, like not of it, right? And I feel like the idea of independence like has colonized humans, human beings. So part of us excavating that from our hearts and our minds and our and the way we interact with each other is a kind of decolonization. So um, I think if that's useful for people, I think that's a great way to think about it. I also don't think it's the only way to think about it. Um, I think it can also be about not so much what you're undoing, but what you're um, reclaiming or remembering. Um, and I know you asked me a question about research, but but I do. But I'm gonna say this first um, because. This is inter interdependence and connection is who we are as human beings. I feel like the, the process that we are engaging in um, is really a remembering, right? We all, because it is part of who we are um, genetically, it's also part of who we are historically. All of us, and we may have to go real far back to find this, but all of us come from people who lived interdependent lives. Mm -hmm. And 
it may not be useful to go back and find out who those people were and try to like reclaim like a particular culture, you know, like on my mom's side, um, there's like, we're part Irish, right? Like, I'm not gonna go back to Ireland and like try to start, you know, kind of reclaiming Irish culture. Like that's, that's not something that's gonna resonate with me. But I do think that knowing that we, that that is true of all of us, right? All of us have come from people who lived interdependent lives. Um, I think is just, uh, I find it reassuring because it means that I'm like, oh, I don't really have to make something up. I just have to like, listen to what my, my history, like what, what my, myself, right? Like what is what I'm like, I'm longing for. And all of us want to belong. We all want to be loved and cared for. Um, we all want to be part of something where we feel like we can make home. And um, knowing that I feel like makes the journey forward into something that feels very different from what I grew up with um, or what we grew up with, right? Like it makes it a little less scary. Now you asked me about research. <laughs> um, so I am so grateful that I learned a fairly, like a while ago, that if I wanted to find answers to like how to be in the world, that the people whose practices, um, cultural ways um, were gonna resonate and point me toward the future that I wanted, were not, you know, dead white men, <laughs> we're not academics, we're not, you know, um, pundits, but were people who were living um, the, in, into the future that I want. And in my experience, those people are usually um, marginalized in some way. So it's black folks, it's queer folks, it's unhoused people, it's sex workers, um, people with disabilities, because the system we have up of success, right? The way that you access resources, the way that you um, are told you're doing a good job, the way that you're supposed to achieve success and happiness. Um, that system is for <laughs> heterosexual, able-bodied, you know, resourced white men. That's who built it. That's who it works best for, or, you know, best meaning like they have, they, they can uh, most easily navigate it. People for whom that system um, either like creates barriers or just outright rejects them, do something else. And that something else, um, like the rejection, and I don't wanna romanticize like how shitty it is to experience oppression and experience like not being able to access resources that you need. But there's a way in which when we can't access those resources through um, the institutions and systems that our society holds up for us, we figure out how to do it in other ways. And that so often involves um, us being in community with each other. Um, it involves us relying on each other um, to get those things. And I feel like I, so I was like, I knew where to look generally, like in what direction to look for the answers I was looking for. Um, you know, probably 80% of the people, um, the stories that I tell in the book are like queer black women. Um, there's unhoused people, there's sex workers, there are people with disabilities. Um, yeah, that's where I feel like I find the most life affirming, um, beautiful, like vision of what it is that the, like the future that we need. Mm. I really resonate with that. I believe that in reading your book, I understand more deeply that what I've seen on like stickers and people say like the future is queer. Like I really could imagine it through all of the stories. And I also really appreciated that you gave big props, big props to black queer women who are often very much on the fringe of our society and have so much creativity, so much resilience, so much like just pop, you know, like totally make culture like, and, um, and I and just, really, let me also say, and like part of what I've found is like black queer women are really doing the work 
yeah. right? They're like, this thing does not work for us. So we need to do something else. And like we, and this is, you know, this is the circles of, again, I don't want to romanticize or generalize, but, but I've, the places where I'm finding people really doing the work of of questioning the ways in which they have, they're practicing, you know, whatever. They're like, am I replicating white supremacy here? Am I replicating patriarchy? Am I replicating um, the like, like punishment and like the carceral state in, in the ways that I'm being in relationship or doing my work or parenting or whatever it is. And that, um, the rigorousness of the questioning is also a thing that I feel like I've learned from black queer women um, mm -hmm. is that it's not just enough. And, you know, like I'm also, because I'm an activist, I'm largely like interacting with activists and organizers, but that it's not just enough to be, you know, it's not just a like, we're rejecting the patriarchy and white supremacy and we're creating some utopia over here. It's like, we're doing this practice with each other and we have to do our work on our own shit. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I wonder how you dropped into your work because there was a part, uh, I don't remember the exact quote in the book, where you say it like you give the, the props to Black queer women and you tell so many like diverse stories that help us imagine the future, but you also warn like don't bust in here uh, occupying and a culture yes, is like totally a <laughs> like there's a there's a fine line like like the book is not meant to be um it's not a how-to right it's not meant to be a blueprint it really is one um to affirm the just the um, the the possibility right like to affirm that the things that i think many of us are looking for are already being practiced someplace um so you really don't have to just like completely make it up. But it is also to be like, well, to, to notice that like, oh, there's a way, there's a way in which I can build family for myself that does not look like this thing that I grew up with or this thing that I was taught or the, or the fact that I'm not doing it, it does not make me a failure, but it's not about replicating any of the, the structures or um, practices or um, you know, family friendship or community structures that, that I show in the book, because it really isn't a how-to book. Part of it is like, there are a million ways to do all of these things. And I just wanted to give people um, a handful of examples, like to serve as inspiration and validation, right? Inspiration that like you can do something else and validation for what so many of us feel, which is that this thing, right, that we've been told is going to make us happy is like misery inducing. So it's, it's like, okay, something else exists. Let me figure this out for myself. And I think, you know, especially as someone who, like lineage is really important. So part of it for me was about um, recognizing that my, you know, none of these ideas just like sprang fully formed from my head. Um, I learned from a lot of people and I really wanted to, um, pay homage to and like recognize the places where I learned. And so much of that was from black folks and so much of that was from queer folks. So it was really important to me that, um, that I just like make that clear and make clear that like you don't get to like, you know, wrap your friendship in a rainbow flag and like be done. Like that part of this for me is solidarity work, right? It's like, if you're, if you're learning from communities that are not yours, then you need to be protecting those communities because those things, right, that they are, that they're teaching us are sacred and we need to treat them that way. Mm -hmm. um, so it means like, okay, like, yes, I can learn about like the querying of friendship, but then like, I need to show up for people um, who are, who are like asexual or aromantic, right? Like um, queer platonic, fr platonic queer friendships are one of the things I talk about in the book. And that thinking came from asexual and aromantic folks. And those folks, like like the visibility of asexual and aromantic folks is like non-existent. And when it is, it is always some kind of like, you know, like they end up being like the serial killer in the, in the show or whatever. So part of it for me is about how am I making sure that the, the groups of people who are giving me this gift that you know that they didn't they didn't like create for me right like to be clear like folks are doing these things for themselves but in doing so it allows me to expand how i think about myself um and i feel like i have a responsibility then to those folks mm -hmm. Let, let's talk about friendship 
I, I love when you talk about re- like friend, just the value of friendship is really the highest value that we have in a relationship. And yet you talk about how somehow maybe the word friend has lost its meaning. And then you take the readers in a new place, which is around queering friendship. So I would mm-hmm. like to talk about friendship with you and like how that queering of friendship uh, you talk about as being liberatory and truth finding for you as you engaged in. in yeah. Friendship. Yeah. That I think, I think the main thing is, is that that I've like I've come to understand that like each of my friendships um, can have its own culture, right? That like friends are not one thing. Um, you know, I think in our in our culture we have like your sexual romantic relationship is meant to be at the top of the hierarchy, and like that that is a very very like pointed mountain, right? Like it's way up here, and then everything else is below that. And um, you know, and you might have your best friends, and then like you know people you hang with or your work acquaintances or whatever. Um, but but that there's not, like part of it is that we try to categorize um, everything and assume that like this label is going to, going to define what the thing means. And I think part of what I learned over the course of researching and writing the book is that each of my friendships can have its own culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and that there's something about at least thinking about it, if not actually being explicit and having a conversation about it with the the person you're in relationship with, um, that can create um, a shared sense of like expectation that can um, open up um, so much room for um, realms of support that you didn't have, for intimacy, for for deeper knowing um, with folks. And just, and that's just from like being like, okay, the friendship label like doesn't really mean anything. So what is, what is the culture of this relationship? And that the spectrum of friendship, right, can be vast. Um, A queer platonic relationship is one that is, you know, as I understand it is like, it's not a sexual romantic relationship, but it's also not what our culture would like have normally defined as like just a friend. Um, It is like, there are people who have queer platonic life partners, right? So there's there's people, they're not sleeping with them. Sometimes they um, are sleeping with other people or have romantic relationships with other people, but they have this uh, a friendship that feels like, um, like a life partnership. Um, and I just think that that's beautiful. And again, part of it is not that you're gonna learn about that and then be like, oh, I need to go find one of these, but just that it, it, it pulls away um, a limitation for what we think of like what friendship is and allows us to just like expand our understanding of what's possible when it comes to our friendships. Yes, one of the examples of that in the book that really struck me and I'd love to hear which story struck you but it was your own story with your friend who um, had um, diabetes. Mm-hmm. And you talk about like at a certain point you had to make the decision that you needed to get all up in her business with her permission. Yes. So you could expand this idea of friendship and really be someone who would be there as a, as a support for her more than just like the good times, but like in the critical times that she might need a friend like you. I'd love to hear yeah. you. Yeah. So um, that's, that's a story about me and Mariah. And I love this woman so much. Um, she's family. She's auntie to my daughter. Um, and I don't remember what it was that was, I think part of it actually, honestly, was that she was becoming more comfortable with she's a deeply independent person. Um, She doesn't have a partner, she lives by herself. Um, She has been managing her diabetes like since she was like 10. Um, And the, so part of it was that she was becoming, she was doing the work of of recognizing her interdependence with people and what it meant to um, allow people to see more of her. And I just had this realization that like in our culture, Um, because there is such a deep expectation that you're going to get married. Um, That if you have a medical condition, they're like your partner, you know, whoever you marry is the person who's going to like be the person who you talk to about that stuff or manages it for you. And I have so many friends who do not have partners, right? And probably never will, um, who are in their like 30s and 40s and 50s. And I was like, oh, what, what does that look like? What, What happens if you have 
a thing that you really need people to um, be aware of, to understand, right? Like to know how to help you manage if you need it. Um, what happens to you if you don't have a spouse for that? So, you know, I was, I spent a lot of time like debating whether or not I was going to bring it up with her. Um, partly because we'd never talked about it, like in terms of like any kind of support I could offer. Um, and she's, and like I said, she's a very independent person, but I was like, I'm gonna bring it up. And if she doesn't want me to be up in her business, she can tell me. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was like, hey, <laughs> like, is there stuff that, that like it would be useful for uh, your, like me to know so that, you know, if you end up in the hospital, like what do the doctors need to know about your diabetes, right? Like stuff like that. Like if I'm with you and you, something happens like as they're like, what do I get? Like, do you need some juice? Do I give you a shot? Like, how do I know what to do? And she was like, no one's ever asked me that before. And I'm like, I know it's not because, you know, her friends are assholes. It's just because we do not have, um, a model of what it looks like to be in our friends lives that way and this was very much because I have been thinking about this so we had a whole conversation where she like she made a spreadsheet with all of her doctors and her information about you know her thing I have um you know she lives alone um so if her blood sugar gets too low like I have an app on my phone um and an alarm will go off and um let me know that her blood sugar is too low so I can check in on her and make you know if I don't hear from her then I can go to her house and I know where the key is and I can go in and like give her a shot of insulin if I need to and now it's not just me like there's a little group of us who she will text if like she's like you know my blood sugar is really low or um, if she's just feeling, you know, funky or she needs to, something needs to happen. She'll text a, a small group of us and, um, we just like, we know what to do. And it means that, you know, my phone is on all the time. I don't turn my phone off at night. Um, and I feel like we are like, I'm, I'm like, we're in each other's lives in this way that we weren't before. And it's like this, this, like, you know, we have these like webs of connection with each other. And it's like this other thread that got um, strong between us. Um, I have another friend who um, has a lot of, uh, like a bunch of health stuff going on. And um, a few months ago asked, you know, they live alone, pandemic times, like all the things, right? They asked if I would, they're like, I'm trying to get my nutrition together. Um, because I need to have surgery in the next year, would you cook for me? Right. And I know that it was, it was so hard. There was all kind of preamble before, like, it's okay if you say no, like all the things. It was so hard for them to ask me to do that. Um, so first of all, I was like, that is some courageous shit right there. Like asking somebody um, to cook for you. Um, and I was like, yes, because I love cooking. And it has turned into this thing. My husband and I both cook. We, it feels like this friend of mine is like part of our family when I'm making a meal, right? When I'm making a meal for, for my husband and my kids and I'm making a meal for them at the same time, it's like there's a part of my table that like extends, you know, outside my house. And I always, I'd always drive over and I drop it off on the porch and I send them a text that says like what it is. And they always like, you know, eventually once they eat it, they like send me a text back. Sometimes I have them pick out recipes and I'll cook whatever that is for them. Um, so like in both of these instances, there's this way in which there's so much courage required from both sides, right? To be up in each other's business. Yeah. And we, like that has redefined my relationships with both of those people. Um, and, you know, and, and, and I'm telling you stories of that, like are about my kind of, you know, my giving going in this direction. But let me tell you, I have had my crises during the pandemic and like it has come back to me um, from them, from other people. And that, you know, there's a, there's a quote in the book um, from this woman, Retta Morris, who talks about the divine circle of giving and receiving and how we often think about like, you know, the gift it is for somebody to receive, but we don't often think about the gift it is for someone to give. And that when we don't ask for help, right? Or we don't accept help, we're interrupting that circle. Mm -hmm. And I think about how, like, like me, you know, 
driving over to Mariah's house when um, her blood sugar is low, which I have done like in the middle of the night in my pajamas, right? Me doing that, me cooking for this friend of mine is so restorative for me. Being in like that kind of intimate connection with these people who I love brings me like, it's just life affirming, right? It brings me a sense of like grounding. Um, and again, it's like, it strengthens that thread, right? That's between us. And like, I'm just so grateful that they allow me to like give to them in that way. Mm -hmm. You know, the other thing I was wondering is you actually mentioned a lot of people, communities and organizations by name and how as a researcher and an author, mm -hmm you get get their permission to do that because I thought yes. that was very profound like you named the people so I um asked everyone so I changed a lot of names in the book oh, um okay. yeah so um I asked uh, yeah totally there's a part right, way in the beginning in the part that nobody reads in the book like I said I say something about um about changing people's names um so I asked everybody um what they wanted me to do if they wanted me to use their real name or not um People, there are people who just said, who said no, and I gave, I let them pick their pseudonym if they wanted to. Um, there were folks who said yes, and then I double checked with them to make sure. Um, and then there was, I think there was a couple of people who said yes, and I was like, they, I was like, I don't think they understand how public this is going to be. I think I'm going to change it anyway. Um, and I feel good about that. So yeah, so I really, I, I checked in with folks. I had a really, you know, I had a form that people filled out um, to give me their, you know, their pronouns, like all their kind of like the way that they identify themselves, like in terms of race and gender and all those things. Um, you know, I just wanted to like correctly um, identify folks. And then I said, I was like, if you, I was like, if you do not answer this question about whether or not I can use your name, I'm just gonna not, not use your name. I'm gonna assume, I'm assuming that I will not say who you are unless you positively affirm that I should. Um, and then the organizations like, you know, there, I talk about um, uh, homefulness in there, for example. Um, I talk about um, People's Kitchen Collective, um, which is like, if y'all don't know People's Kitchen Collective, it is, one of the dopest organizations on the planet. You should know about it. You should give them your money. Um, same with homefulness. Um, that community of folks is, has been around for like two decades in some iteration, has been doing the work. It is a group of unhoused and formerly unhoused people who they have built housing for themselves. They have a radio station, they have a cafe, um, they have multiple publications, they have books, um, they have a school, like they, like they really, um, in many ways, um, like what they have figured out for themselves um, deeply models like the world that I wanna live in. Um, yeah. It's amazing. And you, you should know, give them money too. All y'all in the audience should get homefulness and you should read the book and give all the organizations in the book your money. They are pretty amazing. And they're in Oakland, our, yes. our town too, which is also great. You know, um, you interview all of these folks and what you're, what all of those people working in those organizations are doing is flipping the stereotype about what we believe about poor people. And I know that some of your work has also been around economics. And I wonder if you could speak to why that's so important and maybe synthesize through the stories that um, you're telling in the book, like where our wealth really lies, which is what I think is the essence mm. of the, this idea of family, friendship and community. Yeah, so let's be clear, people need money. Yeah, they um, do. Because we live inside of capitalism and our material and we are like, we are people inside of a body and these bodies need things in order to live. So, and inside of this context, we need money. So I just want to be clear about that first. Yes. Um, part of our wealth lies in having money. Um, but I'm clear from so many of the like, you know, boardrooms and elite spaces that I have been in that folks who have lots of 
wealth of of monetary wealth are some of the loneliest saddest self-hating people i have ever encountered and part of what that looks like is the extraction the i mean you know when it comes to billionaires like the the straight up thievery um the hoarding right that we see is because folks don't have not figured out like the thing that they're trying to fill like that hole in themselves with stuff and wealth like they're trying they're like the american dream says that this is what's gonna make me happy so they keep accumulating um and haven't figured out that like what they need is like neighbors and mm -hmm. friends who they can like you know be messy and cry in front of or get a hug from and folks go on these like excursions to like bali or tibet or whatever trying to find meaning and i'm like the meaning you're looking for is like your neighbor <laughs> is is like is live in your actual life it's not about going someplace else um and again like i don't want to be like all oh, poor people like are, are like wealthy in terms of relationship and like because that's not true um but i know that the folks who i've encountered who have found who have who have who have, who have been forced to replace um, who don't have financial um, capital, so they have, they create social capital, right? Um, and are able to mitigate their experience of being poor through the relationships they have. Mm -hmm. So that they're, you know, being poor in community is very, very different from being poor in isolation. And when you have community, I mean, you know, like there's there's folks in the book who talk about like, you know, being raised by like me by like you know working class single moms and their moms and like all their they all their aunties who were just their mom's friends like pooling you know food in order to like feed the kids like having these potlucks right so that like everybody gets fed or passing around um you know twenty dollars right like this person needs twenty dollars to like pay the light bill. This person needs twenty dollars to um, buy some underwear for their kid. This kid person needs twenty dollars to get you know a book for something. And just like the way in which the community, right, the relationship gets built around sharing and pooling resources. Mm -hmm. And homefulness is a really like a radical example of what that looks like. Um, the practices that they've built over time and the ways in which folks there um, are able to pull resources really allows for um, a lot of like building and creating of stuff. And they also work with people who have a lot of wealth and to get those folks to redistribute their, their money. Um, so that's part of the work that they do too. Um, I don't remember what your original question was at this point. <laughs> it's kind of rambling. All right, you know that what you're saying resonates with me so deeply where you have lived in Oakland for more than 20 years. I grew up in Oakland and in fact, deep East Oakland. Mm -hmm. and that's code for poor people, black people, brown people and queer people are basically who were in my neighborhoods. And yet, despite like, again, I really hear you. Let's not romanticize poverty. It, people need real things. I heard that in what you said loud and clear. But there is this part where I didn't know I was poor because my wealth was my relationships and not only my wealth, my safety. So the other yes. thing gets projected onto like the hood, it is a dangerous place. It really is like in a lot of ways. When I was growing up, it was at the height of the crack cocaine. There were, there were a lot of things that made it very unsafe to grow up there. But at the same time, when I walked through those streets, I knew that I could knock on doors and people had my back. Exactly. I needed a meal. There were other houses that I could go to and get a sandwich. Or if I just needed, like you said, like this connection. And so now it feels like people are having a lot of conversations about what is safe, like unsafe, mm -hmm. not being safe emotionally, not being safe physically. And I wonder if you could talk about some of the ways you explore safety in the book. Yeah. 
So in 1998, I went to the first critical resistance conference in Berkeley, California. And I heard Angela Davis and Ruth Wilson Gilmore and all of these amazing people talking about a world without prisons and policing. And I had no idea what I was getting into. Like a friend of mine who is an immigration attorney now, like said I should go. I think I, think I had seen um, the documentary Angola and was just kind of like blown away by it. And she was like, you should come to this conference. So I went and I was introduced to abolition in 1998 and I have not looked back. Um, and it was really my kind of like introduction to activism which is kind of jumping in the deep end of the pool. Um, like, you know, in 1998, people were not talking about abolition in the same way that they are now. Um, so I remember um, in a, so I joined Critical Resistance as an organizer and a volunteer. And I remember conversations that like questions that we were like, would talk about together about like what safety is and like really like interrogating our idea of what safety is. Um, because it wasn't just about like, like theoretically, like what do we mean when we're talking about abolition, but like how do we as human beings who are in this work, in this movement, um, reconceive of safety for ourselves. And so part of what I began to just like unpack for myself was about like, oh, like the things that make me feel safe are um, not having to worry about whether or not I can pay my rent. Um, knowing that I'm gonna have access to food that makes my body feel good. Knowing that um, the people I know who have medical conditions are gonna have access to healthcare, right? Like I was, and you know, free from violence, that seems like, that's like the low bar. I'm like, obviously, like I don't want to be subject to um, bodily harm. I don't want to be um, in relationships that are abusive. I want to know that uh, if I am in an abusive relationship, that there are people who will help me get out, right? That will help me um, move on in some way, right? And know that, and also understand that, you know, relationships are complicated. There are no good guys and bad guys. Um, the people who we are, like the people who we experience, um, harm and abuse from are usually people who we know, right? Are usually people we're in relationship with. So for so many folks, like calling the cops is not an option. Right. Um, it's not, it's not um, financially an option. It is not, you know, if like my abusive partner is also like a fantastic father, right? I don't want him locked up, right? So people have these very complicated not complicated, they have complex relationships with each other. And what I was inv like invited into was to really interrogate like, what is safety, right? It's not like, oh, this person who's doing this bad thing is therefore a bad person and we should just lock them up forever. It was about how do, how do we reduce whatever harm is happening and for the person who's experiencing it and then reduce the likelihood that whoever that who, who whoever was perpetrating the harm is going to keep doing it. And there was just such a tremendous logic in that for me. I was like, oh, of course. Of course, like what we want to do, we can't just lock everybody up and keep them there forever. Like that's dumb. Like what we want to do is protect people who are experiencing harm, right? Take care of them, help them heal reduce their exposure to whatever the harm is. And then we wanna make sure it doesn't happen again. So the person who's, who's perpetrating the harm actually needs to be healed as well. Um, so just like, like recognizing the like human messiness of that and just recognizing that that's just deeply real. And again, just as we all come from, like if we go back far enough, we come from people who lived interdependently. We also come from places where there are no prisons and police. Mm -hmm. um, that has existed before. And I was like, oh, okay, so we can do that again. Um, and so much of it for me is, is expanding again, like how I think about 
what it means to not just like believe these things theoretically, but be in um, relationship with the people in my life around them and think about what accountability means. Think about, you know, talk to people about what safety means for them. Um, you know, and some of it is like deeply practical. The fact is if, you know, if somebody, I'm right now I'm in my bedroom, which is in the back of my house. If I was here by myself and somebody was breaking into my house in the front, right? I'll be dead by the time the cops get here. But I know all of my neighbors. <laughs> I have all of their phone numbers. If I needed somebody, I could text all of them and be like, y'all go outside and just start yelling. Hey, <laughs> we see you go away, whatever, you know, like those people will actually be there because they, I have physical proximity to them. The cops will show up and like investigate my murder and that doesn't do me no good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Whew, thank you. For and let me say this too. Yeah. One of the things that I have learned in all of the research that I did for this was to notice when um, I was uncomfortable with something somebody was sharing with me. And to, instead of shutting down, arguing, which is one of my defense mechanisms, um, was to be curious and to either be like, say more about that, <laughs> right? Like, like ask for more um, information, ask for a deeper um, understanding, right? Or ask for deeper and more information so that I could have deeper understanding. Or, and or ask myself, right? Like, what am I uncomfortable with? Like, what is this? What am I being activated around for this thing? Is it that I fundamentally disagree with what this person is saying or like judging them for some experience they had? Or is it like my own stuff, what I feel like it's saying about me or, um, or whatever. So I feel like that in, in our relationships with each other um, is so critical because it's so easy for us to react and then be pissed at somebody or react and like cut them off. Um, my therapist who I interviewed for the book and who I talk about in the book, she uh, she said to me once, she was like, resentment is information for you. And I was like, bitch, shut up. Like what? <laughs> like I thought resentment was like when I get to be self-righteous because somebody else is has like messed up and isn't doing what they're supposed to be doing. And she's like, no, resentment is information for you. And it lets you know, it's like an alarm that goes off in your system that lets you know that a boundary has been crossed. Um, and usually because I have not articulated that boundary, I've not set the boundary. And I feel resentment because I've let that boundary, like I didn't, I was not clear about it or I've let it be crossed. And I feel like um, in my relationships, it is totally changed. It has changed like how I interact with my husband. It's changed how I parent. Um, it has changed some of my friendships because I'm like, oh yeah, I often, I resent this person often. That's because I have crappy boundaries with them and I need to articulate what those boundaries are. And the other thing Shauna, my therapist said is that um, when you tell people, like telling people what your boundaries are, you're giving them information about you. You're letting them know you and that there's an intimacy in that. And I think often we think of boundaries as a way of pushing people away. And I think it's really a way of revealing who you are um, right. in a way that builds intimacy. You, I mean, that is one of the tenets of friendship that you give examples of in the book from people who have learned to negotiate those boundaries in some probably ways that we wouldn't think is that where you, that's where you would learn it. Um, you talk yeah. about a who is um, practicing BDSM um, and mm -hmm. that, that is where, and, and then she taught you the language. Learning that, about consent, totally. Like so many, yes. So, such like good stuff. I mean, this is the thing, right? Like I think about um, the people I know who are sex workers and how clear they have to be about boundaries to do the work that they do. Um, same with people who do BDSM. Um, polyamorous folks have got like monogamous folks like totally beat when it comes to 
communication, about boundaries, about needs and wants, about all like dealing with, with like ways in which we get activated and we get jealous or angry or whatever with our partners. Like there, this is what I'm saying, like communities of folks who are not practiced, who are not in a mainstream, you know, um, kind of idealized relationship end up having to figure out how to navigate the relationships they are in, in ways that are healthy for people. And like the rest of us can learn from that. Um, yeah, like that, that's just like, that's so good. It was like, so juicy and good to hear totally. that. Totally. So I want to shift gears a little bit before we go to Q&A. We've talked about lineages and reclaiming like, um, you know, our practices of storytelling and um, our practices of like a time before there was a police through our relationships that we could negotiate our communities and families together. Um, and then being present with knowing our boundaries, redefining safety, choosing families and mm. setups, like unconventional setups that just work better for us than the totally. American. And I want to shift to talking about the future. So we're saying COVID. We went past, present. We were living, Black people live in three three dimensional yes. time anyway, right? The ancestors. Absolutely. Now, yes. And our children often represent our future. So I wanted to talk about children. I did read the beginning part of the book where you dedicated the book to your children, Stella and Solomon. And throughout the book, you share so many stories of ways like siblings who decide to co-parent together, mm -hmm. like um, ways that people are raising and negotiating. Uh, what was it called? The mama, the mama houses, like the way yep. that were coming together, like all these creative ways especially out of black queer communities that people are negotiating um, how to raise children. And I wonder if you could talk about the most um, important lessons for all of us around child rearing that we mm. can learn from the people in the book whose stories that you tell. Um, there were some really beautiful ones. And I, I, one, there was a couple who talks about raising their kids with queer thinking that was so profound to me and that, um, yeah, creating these very intentional families that if something happened to them as parents, yes. they had like a bunch of aunties and totally step in at a moment's notice. I mean, I think that like one of the, and I'll say like, I don't, I don't like, you know, my kids are 10 and 15. So I feel like I started to figure out a lot of this after they were older. Um, but I feel like one of the biggest gifts that we can give kids is um, multiple places where they feel home so that it's not just about, you know, living with their parents and like one house. And then like, that's where their family is, but that they can, and I feel like black folks do this all the time, right? Like you may live with your parents during a part of your life, but maybe you spend the summers with your grandparents or your auntie lives in a better school district. So you're with your auntie during the week and then you go to your, back to your parents, you know, on the weekends or whatever. Like we have all of these configurations. And I think from like a kind of white supremacist lens, like that looks like instability. But what it really is, is that this child, like a family is like, again, pooling resources to support children. And that this, this, you know, these children can find home in multiple places. And I just think about like, what a gift that is. Um, I think that, you know, like the idea that two people can raise a kid by themselves is ridiculous. And nobody has taught me more that more than single mothers um, because my mom did not raise me by herself. Um, so many of the unpartnered women who I, who I interviewed for the book, like they have their villages who are not only villages who are not only helping them raise their children but who they are part of right it's not just about like the village raising the kids it's about like they are in community with each other everybody is um so i think that like that having having multiple caring adults um in the life of your children like my kids totally have chosen family um sometimes it's the same people sometimes it's different people um, I'm like, I know that, you know, part of what I think about as a former sex educator, I'm like, I wanted my kids to have people to go to, to talk about sex when they didn't want to talk to me. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, I was like, let me assume that even if I think I'm like cool mama, right. <laughs> that these babies are not going to want to talk to me about sex all the time. So if I'm like, but I want them to have people who I trust 
who they feel close to, who they can have those conversations with. So I feel like multiple places they can call home many caring adults, right? Um, and then I think the other thing is, right, like part of what that does is it gives them models for how, who they can be in the world, for what it means to build relationship with people, um, like being part of community, right, is how you learn to be part of community. Um, I feel like there are ways in which so many of us are like as adults having to figure that out. But there are so many kids that I know who have just like come up in these amazing communities. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna learn from this child over here because they know how to do this. <laughs> like they know how to show up um, in community. Um, so that just feels really important to just like not as parents in particular to feel like we're supposed to do all of it ourselves um, to really make sure we're like bringing people together for our babies. Did you get a chance to talk to any children in your research who were growing up that way or was it mostly observation? Um, it was, I mean, I, I, did not, I did not interview any children, okay. um, but I was in conversation with people who, and their kids sometimes. And um, I have a community of, of folks where there are a lot of kids. Um, so part of it for me was also just being like looking at you know knowing their children like knowing the the children of the people who i was interviewing like i you know a lot of people in the book are my friends um yeah. so i know their kids um so no i didn't actually interview any kids for it but i definitely observed their kids and know their kids and one of the things you do is give really good examples and inspiration for how we need to get in each other's parenting business too like for folks who don't have kids or have grown kids or just have the bandwidth to be one of those aunties yes. or, you know, God parents or whatever to God bless single the aunties who don't have no children. Yes. Um, it is. I'm so grateful for, yes, there's a kind of bandwidth that people who do not have kids will have with, for my children. And you know, something that I didn't realize is, um, and you know, and and in retrospect, I was like, obviously, but you know, so Mariah, who I talked about earlier, like she and she's Stella's auntie, my daughter's auntie, and um, it took me a while to understand that when she would, you know, have Stella over for a sleepover or whatever, like it wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, I'm doing Mia a favor. I'm like, oh, she actually loves spending time with my kid because my kid is awesome. So it was like, I was like, oh, like I think of, you know, I think of childcare, right, as like a task or a burden or whatever um, that, I'm, that I sometimes will ask somebody to do. Um, but for people who are in my children's lives, like they're delighted to be able to hang out with my awesome kids because they're super fun and they have a relationship. Um, so I just felt like like that reframe for me as a parent was really important to understand. So it made me feel less um, kind of self-conscious about asking people to step in and like take my kids for a little while. And let me tell you, I cannot wait until this pandemic is over because I am bored of all these people that I live with and I want my babies to go be with some other people. With their folks, that's right. Yes. That's but I still think there's ways that even in the pandemic that we don't give up our responsibilities. Maybe we double down on them in terms of our friendships and uh, being aunties and still- Totally. I know so many people who have like, you know, regular, have regular scheduled like Zoom time with their like friends' kids. Um, my son goes to an outdoor school. So he's actually been able to spend most of the school year like in his community. Um, <laughs> And my daughter got to hug Mariah, who's now fully vaccinated, got to hug her like over the weekend. And it was amazing. It's the first time my daughter's hugged anybody who was not her parents or her brother in more than a year. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm excited. I'm like, all right, we're gonna get these children out of this house. <laughs> and with once all these people are vaccinated, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been really, I think it's been for all of us, it's been really challenging to figure out how to be present for people. Um, and there are lots of ways that we have like been creative about doing it. And there's just like, there isn't anything to replace being in each other's presence, like spending time together, like being able to hug people and, you know, snuggle them and all of that stuff. Um, like yeah. it, it, it has made me, I think it's made all of us realize how deeply necessary um, that kind of contact is. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you brought us back to where we began this conversation about our human need for love. And with that, I'm going to look in the Q&A and see some of the All right. questions here. So this one comes from Robin Barron. In your book, you talk about how capitalism creates barriers to self-awareness. Can you tell us more about what you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, capitalism wants us to understand, to believe that our value comes from being productive. That, I mean, the way that we um, talk about how hard we're working, the way that we will sacrifice sleep, time with loved ones, all of these things for work. I don't know anybody whose time is not anchored by their paid labor, right? If they have a job, then their paid labor anchors their day and we put everything else around that including me, right? Like, I'm like, there's times of, there's a time of day when I do paid labor. So if I want to exercise, I have to get up early to do that. If I, you know, the cooking I do got to happen afterward or on the weekend, like time that I spend with my children and my family on, right? Like it's all anchored, like paid work is the sun around which everything revolves. Mm -hmm. So capitalism really wants us to see ourselves as having to earn our humanity, our deservedness, our worth. And that orientation does not allow us to really be um, in touch with who we are and what we want. Um, it doesn't allow us to be in touch with our deep need for rest, mm -hmm. for time to just be and not be trying to be efficient or get shit done. And it also um, has us, capitalism does, has us, you know, I don't know anybody who doesn't do some kind of purchasing as a way of um, feeling good, right? For some of us, it's like, you know, we bought, like I bought a lot of leggings <laughs> during the pandemic. <laughs> and like face care things, right? Some people it's travel, some people it's food, like eating out or whatever, like they're like, we are um, encouraged to, to satisfy um, some need we have through purchasing something. Um, I mean, it could still be like an experience, but it's still like some, something we have to pay for. So um, yeah, I just think that capitalism makes it makes it really challenging. I mean, partly because we so much of our time is given to it, but it makes it challenging for us to be um, super in touch with who we are and, and aware of like what we want and need. Mm -hmm. Great question, Robin. Thank you. Um, we have questions rolling in. So this one is from someone who didn't give their name says, it seems to me that in all the efforts to have people socially distanced to prevent getting sick from COVID, our culture has ignored the real mental and physical harms caused by social isolation. What are your thoughts about social distancing and how we might balance the need for human connection and the need for caution? I've been wondering, like, how are we all going to come back together after being so skin I know. Hard to want to, I'm really concerned about more. I mean, I don't think that's true that that's been ignored. I feel like that's the conflict that so many people are talking about. And, and that there are people who are clearly like, I can't not be around people. So I'm going to ignore all the social distancing stuff. So I don't, I think that, and I think that in terms of what, like public officials say that might be true, but it's not our culture. Our culture is 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 um, not unified at all around it, and is pretty um, kind of, I think, layered when it comes to that. Um, how do I think we need to think about that? I mean, I think that we all need to be, you know, part of part of what's ch been challenging about this is that the information has changed over time. Um, we, you know, we spent the most of the pandemic with a anti-science fascist asshole in control of the country. So it was very difficult to um, figure out what was real, right? To like actually, to like get information that we needed. Um, 
I think all of us need to think about what consent looks like um, in this context and be more transparent and um, proactively communicative with the people in our lives about our safety practices when it comes to COVID, about, you know, vaccinations, like all of those things, so that we're all making, like, because, you know, I'm like, I cannot wait to hug people. And I'm like, I need, I want to think about like, under what circumstances I'll be willing to do that. And I want to, I want to protect both my own sense of safety, but also like find out what is going to make the people in my life feel safe. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like there's a whole conversation that um, or, or a whole practice around consent that we really need to engage in, in or, and that we should have been engaging in before during the right. pandemic. I mean, and in just in life. Um, but that as we are, as we're um, going to be coming in contact with each other, that we are like asking before we hug people, that before we meet up with somebody, we're, we're saying like, okay, so here's here are the things that I would like for us to agree to in order for me to feel safe. Like, what is it that you need in order to feel safe? Um, and, it's, and again, this is like another place for us to um, like in a practical way, practice consent, but it's also a way for us to build intimacy with each other because we're talking about what makes us feel safe with people. And we don't usually have those kinds of conversations with our friends. Um, so I think that feels really important to me. Thank you. That was a great answer. Thank you. I've, I've been thinking about what it will be like having been like in when we go outside of our homes for essential things like grocery shopping and things like that, that we're, I've been um, policing the people around me, like strangers yes. around me. So there's our- I know. I'm such a jerk sometimes. And back, you know, and- I My wonder, auntie, my auntie stare is like over, you know, with the mask on, like the eyebrow, when when somebody's like in the grocery store and has, has their nose, you know, over their mask. I'm such a jerk. <laughs> and I'm working on that. Like, I'm, you know, I'm like, they, whatever. People, people are coming to everything with their own, stuff. Um, but part of what's been challenging, right, about the pandemic is that we wear our masks to protect other people. Yeah. So like, I can't, I'm not putting on my mask because it's good for me. I'm like, I'm like, I'm putting it on because it's good for all y'all. So if you're not wearing your mask, you're not doing your part, right? Like you're basically saying, I don't give a shit about you. And that feel like, this is one of the things that I feel like I'm, I'm asking myself, I'm being curious about. I'm like, what is that, like that uncomfortable feeling I have, right? That reaction that I have to just like police or condemn. Um, I wanna understand that more and find, find the place where I can both hold my boundary, but also not um, undermine someone's humanity. I'm like, even people who are being assholes are whole human beings. So, and, so. and I need to, I want to hold, I want to be able to sit with like, this person is not behaving in a way that's okay with me. So I need to set a boundary around it. And I need to do that from a place that recognizes that they're a person. So important. Here's another question from Eve. I'm starting an online community with about seven people. Several of us are reading how to show up. Yay. Thank you, Eve and how we, ha we are hella inspired. You must be from Oakland, hella inspired. We wanna be an intentional community where people feel safe and supported. And I'm curious if you have any suggestions for forming and creating this type of community. Mm. Is there anything you would suggest that we could consider and practice? So this is a virtual community. Yeah, so it's online. I mean, I think that like starting just with, you know, folks like journaling or writing about what would make them feel good like what are the kinds of things that they would want like what's their vision for this community and then like comparing notes and figuring out what are the things that you want to um come to agreement around um what are the things are there thing are there rituals that you want to have like every time you gather um how are you going to hold responsibilities for the community right like um, is, is one person going to always kind of, um, hold space for everybody? Is one person always going to like do the scheduling or are you going to like rotate those things? Like thinking really practically about what's necessary to make the thing run, um, is important. So I have multiple, what either started as in-person things that have moved to virtual spaces since the pandemic and several communities have emerged, 
um, for me during the pandemic. Um, and they all function in totally different ways. Some of them, one person really is holding everything and facilitating everything and others we rotate um, those responsibilities. Um, and I think like all of those things work. I think it really is just like, what is the, what does the group collectively want? Um, and you find that out by asking. And that can maybe change over time too with the group. Absolutely. Wants. This is, so one of my groups, I have, me and one other person have really held a lot of the space. And I recently realized, I was like, I'm feeling resentful. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's information for me. And I was like, oh yeah, I don't want to hold this by myself anymore. I'm like, I really want everybody, I want other people to, to own some of the space holding and facilitating. And as soon as I asked, people were like, oh yes, of course. Um, and it was great. And I'm like, oh, phew, like I don't have to like feel like I'm, you know, burdened by the responsibility of this thing anymore. Um, so that just feels really important to just like be clear about that. Yes. And just know that anything you decide can also change and evolve and grow. It's so amazing what you just said there was that sometimes when we ask, we're making this big story in our, ha our heads. Oh my God. Yes. But for like, yes, we're, we can do that for you or we can change or in any way that you needed support or they can. We're so, we're so allergic to asking for help. Yes. And I like one of the deepest lessons of the pandemic for me has been asking for help and accepting support. Just saying yes when people offer support. Not because I'm like, you know, like I had this friend who in the beginning of the pandemic, she texted like three of us and she was like, I'm going to the grocery store. Do y'all need anything? And immediately, like in my head, my answer was no, because this was when you like go to the grocery store, you had to like stock up for three weeks and you had to wash everything. And like, it was just a pain in the ass to get groceries. And so I was like, I'm not gonna, like, I don't need anything. I can go to the grocery store myself, right? And then, and I was about to be out of salt. And, you know, I don't know about y'all, but I can't cook anything if I don't have no salt. So I was like, if she gets me salt, I won't have to go for another week. So I was like, I'm gonna say yes. And I said, yes, I could use some salt. And she brought me salt. I happened to be in the front of my house and she dropped it off and I saw her through the window. And in that moment, like her face just like lit up. And I was like, oh yeah, this is the kind, this is, especially the, it was the beginning of the pandemic. We're all like trying to rally, right? To like be like, to make sure everybody's okay. And I was like, oh yeah, she feels good. Like she made the offer because it was something that was going to make her feel good. And so again, my saying yes, right, was this like gift that I gave to her. And it went on like some one week she brought me oats, another time she brought me coffee. Like it was just this amazing thing that she would just be like, I'm going to the grocery store, do y'all need anything? And we would like tell each other where you could find toilet paper, because this was when people were hoarding the toilet paper, you couldn't find the toilet paper. Like it was lovely. So I feel like one of the deep lessons I've learned um, in the pandemic has been asking for help, accepting support when it's offered. And, and that you don't have to, like, I think we often feel like we have to know what kind of help we need. Sometimes all we need is to be witnessed. Mm -hmm. Sometimes all we, all we really want is to tell somebody how we're feeling. I had a friend call me today who said, who's like, I'm just calling because I need to say these things out loud. Mm -hmm. And I just, and it was good that they said that because I was like, okay, my job here is not to fix anything. My job is to listen. Mm -hmm. And they just like said what they needed to say. And I was like, and I just affirmed it and just like, you know, let them know I was listening and like, it, and just like, was like, yeah, that sounds really hard. It makes a lot of sense that you would feel that way. Um, and they just felt better because they got seen. Um, and sometimes that's the help that we need. Um, sometimes we really don't know what we need other than we just need to say the thing out loud to another person. And especially right now, because so many of us are so isolated and we're all traumatized in different ways, but everyone has experienced trauma in this pandemic. And I think a lot of us really, especially as things start to open up, like we really need to be talking to our folks about what we're feeling so that we don't come out of these houses and all that trauma comes out sideways and makes a mess. Ooh, what a mess that could be. You know, you talk about what you just stated, like not only how we show up for people during the good times, you just gave a great example, like at the beginning of the pandemic, I loved all the people who brought me toilet paper and Clorox wipes and salt or whatever it was. Totally. Like team, it was like being on a team. Yes. 
But, you know, there is a part of the book where you talk about how we show up for people during the hard times, like yeah. when they're grieving, and you just explained it. We don't always have to fix it or have a solution that at our core, we also need to be witness, and that's a part of loving one another. And I think this is one of the hardest things for me is like, I am so uncomfortable with other people's pain. Um, partly because I'm like, I don't, because I feel like I have to fix it and I don't know what to do. Um, mm -hmm. I think it makes me think about my own pain and suffering, right? So I, I feel like one of the things I've really been working on, especially during the pandemic, because so many people are losing loved ones, are suffering just like all it's just you know it's lots and lots of trauma so one of the things i'm really working on is like being present enough with myself to feel and your body tells you this stuff immediately your body's so wise right it tells you i'm like i can feel when i'm starting to get uncomfortable and for me to be like to be like oh yeah you like notice that and know that that's not like there's nothing nothing is happening to me right like the discomfort is is like a kind of panicky sense that i have and i'm like i'm okay i'm just listening to this person who i care about talk to me and and then also my urge to like fix it i'm like i notice that and i'm like mm -hmm. that's not what we need right now mm -hmm. just listen mm -hmm. and then i can you know like once they feel like and it's amazing for folks like to be able to just like talk and be heard and seen and witnessed in whatever it is that they're that they're dealing with. And then I will ask them like, is there anything that, do you want help with this in any way, right? Can I offer something? Um, and sometimes folks are like, no, I just needed to say all that. And other times they're like, yes, please. I would like some advice, like, what can I do? And, I'm, and I'll be like, have you tried this or whatever? Um, so I just, I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to slow down that's like, I think one of the things what for me, because, because like I said, like being with people when they're talking about death or hardship or whatever, that is an uncomfortable, uncomfortable place for me. So I'm slowing down and paying attention, being in, you know, being in my body enough, breathing to pause and just know that there's no urgency. There's no hurry to whatever is happening between me and this person. Slow down. I think that's one of the wisdoms of. Uh, Let's all take a breath. All y'all who are watching, just like take a breath right now. Feels good whenever I do that. Thank you for reminding us just to be mindful of the wisdom of our bodies, right? It's yeah. not all the time. You have to listen and slow down and pay attention to that. Well, I'm going to go to a couple more questions. So I'm going to ask you to take off your wonderful therapist hat there. <laughs> <laughs> educator hat. I wish we had had time to talk about more of the research and lessons learned being a sex educator. Um, and, and why do we feel so racy about sex when we're about, this isn't even really a sex question per se, but it says, how do we combat? I think as most, a lot of folks haven't had none, all, all the single folks haven't had none. So maybe that's why this is an exciting question. How do we combat the societal judgment directed at platonic intimacy? Mm. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I have to read a little bit into that question yeah. some, and I think part of it is that, um, you know, we live in a society that says, um, like if in some way that if you're single, you're not done, right? So if, if, the, if so there's, there's, a, there's a piece in there that I feel like um, is that platonic intimacy, okay, so it can be a couple of things, right? You can, you can not have a partner <laughs> and there's some way in which uh, our society is like, well, you're not quite an adult unless you like get married. And especially if you're a woman, let's be clear. Um, and then there is just this idea that like intimacy, um, like deep closeness outside of a sexual romantic relationship, like that really y'all just really want to have sex with each other, but you just like, don't do that. Um, how can we combat it? I don't know. I mean, I think part of, you know, so much of stuff like that really is just that we need more models for it. Um, but I also like like I'm wondering what, like why, like what we need to do that for. Um, I feel like in my life, I have 
I have a really, really um, close platonic intimate relationship with a man. And definitely most of my friends were like, he wants to sleep with you. Um, and I was like, he doesn't. And I don't want to sleep with him. Like, it's not about sex. And like, you know, and I kind of kept having to say that for a while. And now we've been friends for many years. And that's just like, and people stop talking about it. Like, and we still have our awesome relationship. And um, I don't like, it's not like it's oppressive to me in any way. I mean, it's a little annoying, um, but I don't know that we have to combat it other than to live our lives. Mm -hmm. And when there are, you know, I think we need more stories of those relationships. I mean, there's, there actually are like some amazing um, examples in pop culture. So um, Meredith and Christina, uh, Christina, Christina on Grey's Anatomy, totally platonic, platonic intimacy there. Um, the version of Sherlock that Lucy Liu was in, it's called Elementary. Lucy Liu's character and the Sherlock character are like deep, deep platonic intimacy, not a sexual relationship, but like they're each other's people, they're family to each other. Um, Steven Universe, the cartoon Steven Universe has amazing platonic intimacy. So I actually think that like there are examples of these relationships um, in pop culture that we should um, be paying more attention to. And that if you're in one of those relationships, like you can point to um, for people who need to like, you know, find a place where they're they're like them they might understand it a little bit more like you can point to those relationships um they are some of like like my platonic intimate friendships have been some of the like most juicy amazing wonderful um spaces for me to be a person in um my friend who i'm thinking about teddy um like that relationship allows for a kind of, like we're both committed to each other's personal growth in a way that's really, really powerful. Um, like that's, it's just a beautiful relationship that's not like, that provides me with something that no other relationship gives me. Um, so if you have those relationships in your life, like good on you. Such a blessing to have those relationships across boundaries of gender, especially across boundaries of gender, gender which are sometimes hard to negotiate, right? With like you yeah. said with your husband because of preconceived notions that everybody that is you know a different gender or different even orientation wants to sleep with you totally that's not true just not true i am going to put the next two questions which are uh, sent by some of the audience together because i think they're both kind of asking the same thing the first one is asking about how to create new friendships and in deeping those deepen existing friendships especially now during the pandemic. And the other one is talking about single parents. Like how can every a single parent, um, especially the ones who don't feel like they have that community support, create a community like that? And you've got a great story from the book about how you did just that, um, created with parents. Um, yes, I did. So that was, it was a very practical, you're talking about kid fun. Um, so this is a very practical thing that I did when when my kids were a lot younger, my son was two, so my daughter was seven. And, you know, my husband and I had not had like a date in a very, very long time. And we, so I was like, I know that other parents have the same thing. So I asked two other families if they wanted to do a thing called kid fun, um, which is basically like our marketing for the kids, right? We're like, it's like kid fun. Um, and it was fun for them. And basically every other weekend, every other Saturday for four hours, it was like five to nine, one family would get all the kids and then the other two, these were all straight couples. Um, then the other two families could like go on a date. And so first of all, I got to go on a date with my husband. And part of it for me was that I was like, I am bougie. So I want to go out and I want to have fancy cocktails, but you can't have fancy cocktails and pay for childcare. Like it's just too much. Um, certainly on a regular basis. And I was like, this way I don't got to pay for no childcare so I can get all of my fancy cocktails. Um, so it was great for like date night happened, right? And sometimes to be clear, date night was like staying at home and having sex before it got dark outside, um, which was fantastic. And we were not tired. Um, but the other thing is that um, the children, so the children like, you know, who all like, we'd known one family since the, the, my daughter was three, they went to preschool together, but like the kids all had like their own relationship. Um, and that got strengthened regardless of like where they were and where they're going to school. And then the kids, um, 
had, had these relationships with the other adults. And that part, like I love the children um, and we don't do it anymore. Cause like now the kids are old enough to stay home by themselves um, and we can go on date night. Um, but like, I love these children, right? They are like, they were part of, we did this for many years and it was beautiful. Um, and that was just like, that part of it was unexpected for me. Like, I just was like, I have a practical need to go on a date with my husband. Um, but we all just ended up getting so much more out of it. So the bigger question here is like, how do you make friends and how do you build community, right? And there's no one answer to that. But the thing that I feel like I want us to understand is that one, it takes time, right? You do not build community in a year. Um, it, like it is a, it's an ongoing process. Um, and even when we have built community, like those relationships need to be tended to, right? The, the, the topography of our community changes um, over our lifetimes is like, you know, cause we're all like, everybody is, is doing different things. People move away, they, they come together, they get other friends. So they make a distance or they get closer. Like that all changes always. Um, so the relationships need to be tended to. And I think that um, building friendship, like making friends and building community requires courage, right? It requires that you um, make yourself vulnerable and available to people and that you ask, right? I mean, I have a handful of friends that I've made in adult where literally I was like, like I met somebody and I was like, can we be friends? <laughs> like, can we, you know, and sometimes people will say yes and then you don't ever hear from them again. And other people will say yes. And then like you become friends. Um, and I've learned to not take it personally at all when people, because people just feel like they kind of have to say yes sometimes. And I was like, that person didn't really want to say yes, but that's okay. Like I get that they are just not, that's like, they don't have room in their life, like whatever, like that's fine. Um, and I feel like if you do that with enough repetition um, and frequently enough, you end up to start to like, you know, it starts to fill out and you have your people. Um, but there's no, there's no like magic formula that I've discovered for how this has happened. I don't have any like how to or like five steps to making friends for folks. I really just think it's like time and courage. Mm -hmm. And I think the other key piece you named was that you have to attend to the relationships that you have. Yes. Well. Like be very intentional about nurturing those. So that's the end of our questions. I want to just thank you so much, Mia. And I realized that I developed, uh, so I first I got so much inspiration from all of the people who agreed to be mentioned in your book. And so I feel like I owe them a deep gratitude. Mm, thank you. Selves for just living their yes. lives in unconventional ways and really um, inspiring the rest of us to take direction. I also recognize through their stories, the ways that I have some of that, that I didn't see it that way. Mm. Oh, oh, that's so good. She's so juicy and good, right? Totally. Well, because it's like, once you see it, you're like, you can point to it and then you're like, oh, I can do, sorry, my alarm's going off. Um, you can, so you're like, oh, I can do more of that, right? Like these are the, these are the places I want to lean into. Like these are the practices and ways that I am in my life that I want to lean into because they're, they're like the direction I want to be going. And then you can kind of shed the other things or let go of it. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if for the last word, if you could offer some in inspiration to folks that are really feeling isolated, mm. maybe you're feeling hopeless or feeling like, you know, really don't feel that they have friendship community. Um, and so if we could give them our final, your final word and blessing, that would be amazing. Yes. You know, one of the things that, again, my brilliant therapist, um, let me know during a period of time during the pandemic where I was feeling like just deeply overwhelmed. Um, she was like, she, she gave me this practice. She said, go lay down on the ground, like the earth, not like the concrete, go lay down on the ground and put your left ear to the ground. And she was just like, let everything that you're holding all your fear, worry, anxiety, loneliness pour out of you into the earth. Mm -hmm. She was like, the earth can hold all of that and not like, it ain't no thing for her. She just composts it. She's like, give it, give it all to her. Just go ahead, pour it all out. And, and in retrospect, I can't remember if it was left ear or right ear. So do whatever feels 
right to you. And she's like, once you feel like it's all like the wave of stuff has just like come out of you, turn your other ear to the ground and listen for the message that she has for you. And what happens when you do this, first of all, when you lay down on the earth, you realize how the earth is holding you all the time, right? Like right now, all of you who are listening, like just feel gravity, right? Like underneath your, if you're sitting like underneath your thighs, under the underside of your chin, like the bottoms of your feet, like the earth is holding all of us. The reason we don't go spinning off into space is because she's holding us. We are always being held by her. She ain't never gonna let you go. And there's something that, that reminds me of, which is that we're never alone. We might be lonely for people and that's real. We might be lonely for being touched by other human beings and that is real. But we are, you know, today's Earth Day. Yes, it is. And I don't know about y'all, but I kind of grew up with an idea of what it meant to care for the earth that was very much about like, we're going to like, this is kind of paternalistic, like we're going to take care of this thing and the polar bears and the, you know, whatever creatures on it um, as something that's separate from us, right? We are like, we have the, we can be conquerors or we can like, you know, take care of the earth and all the creatures. Um, but we've grown up with this idea that like we're separate from nature and largely that's come from like a kind of colonizing, conquering um, place. Um, and what I've remembered because I felt this as a child is we are nature. We're not separate from nature, right? Like we are nature. And that means that the sky, right, like is of us, like the air we breathe is like, is, is all over the place. Um, the earth is holding us. The trees are our elders. So for me, when I feel like I'm feeling disconnected, um, large for myself or from people, I remind myself that I am nature. Everything that's out there is inside of me. And I try to find places for me to reconnect. It might be this house plant over here, <laughs> that might be as far as I can get, um, or it might be going outside uh, and laying on the ground. Um, it is not, it does not make up for the loss of human contact that we've had, but I think it helps some. Thank you, Mia Birdsong. What a beautiful and auspicious way to end on this Earth Day of 2021. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for this conversation, for your questions and your attention. And thank you for being such a thoughtful, present holder of this conversation. Thank you. Be well, everyone. Thank you all so much for attending today. We hope that you'll join us for more of our upcoming talks and workshops. This conversation was recorded. If you'd like to watch it again or share it with your community, it will be available on our YouTube channel at the same link and on our Facebook page. We'll also feature this talk on our podcast, which you can find at ciispod.com or by searching CIIS Public Programs on your favorite podcast app. Thanks again for joining us and good night. Thank you.